So, I haven't even thought up an intro, um, <laughs> but I guess it's not a talk, and that's going to become painfully obvious pretty quick. This is a lot of stuff, if anyone read the abstract, that we're going to cover in the next 90 minutes. Um, and it's a lot of stuff that's been kind of hacked together, and I think that there's going to be a user at home thing, but I don't know how our infrastructure is going to hold up, uh, so it could blow up and crash, and this could get a lot more talky, uh, but we're going to all hope for the best. <laughs> and with that, <clears throat> we're going to start off by talking about, there is going to be like a little lecture part, and then we're going to dive into like the hands-on experience, but the idea of this whole talk is, not talk, workshop, is that you can take this and probably blow it out into like an entire semester course if you wanted to. It is a lot of hello worlds that were, have all been strung together to create a real front to back data science experience, if you will. Um, that's the sort of the idea. We start off with, you know, every time we're learning to do data science, here's this little toy data set. It's all nice and clean for you. And we run some random for ta-da. And okay, that's cool, but where, where do we go next? How did we get to where we're at? This, this is uh, our phrase, soup to nuts. We're starting with a raw API. We're building an infrastructure to start collecting data that, since we hand rolled it, has some issues, and now we've got some jammed up data. Then we're cleaning up our data, and it pretty much gets you up to the point of, okay, now you're ready to start doing your data science. From there, you can pick up any stupid tutorial on, you know, whatever library you want. Because right now I think there's about 650 and counting machine learning libraries for in-core, GPU, da, 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 whatever you want to do. Um, yeah. So in the interest of getting the best code and the best examples possible, we really neglected, for example, a talk. We gave a talk last week. And I'm like, oh yeah, we should have some slides and talk. We should talk about that again. So we just kind of struck. So I'm going to breeze over some fast. This was for a bunch of Python people at a meetup here in Chicago. But it at least kind of sets the stage on how we're collecting the data. And again, all of this code is going to be available. Um, but you wouldn't be able, it's been collecting data since January for me. So we have a data set that you're going to be able to interact with. But if you were going to repeat and do this, you'd be building your own data set. And here's what it's going to look like. Um, Starts off using um, OpenWhisk uh, on IBM Bluemix. Uh, the main motivation for this is I work for Bluemix and I can use all the cloud resources I want and don't have to charge them or pay for them as long as they're on this. But the idea is you're going to want some sort of platform as a service. And I'm a big fan of everything Apache and this is an open source. You can build this on any system, though we're not going quite that deep. Um, here's our architecture diagram. And real quick, the idea is, so every, everybody know what Airbnb is? Okay, so Airbnb has an API that's public that's not published, um, but you can open up Firefox and you can get in and you can figure out what the rest calls are, and there's a couple websites. So we're gonna use a Python app, we're gonna make calls. Um, you know what, let's start with this. How many people are Python users? Okay, everyone, all right, we can, we're gonna skip ahead a little bit. How many people are familiar with the request package? Still pro make, making calls and requests, awesome. Um, how many people are familiar with Flask? Still doing, for those who aren't, Flask is a uh, really lightweight Python like web server. It lets you create dynamic sites. Um, how many people are familiar with MongoDB? Still looking pretty good. For those who aren't, it's a NoSQL database and basically you can write Python dictionaries or hash maps if you don't know Python, straight into the database. Great, in my opinion, for caching REST calls because those always come back, usually come back in JSON, so you can just hand them right off. Um, so we got this Python app that sits in the middle. Perfect. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so how exactly we scrape this data? The public API will give you not exactly everything we want. What we're gonna get is not gonna be a great data set to start off with. It's the API that powers basically this. Give it a second to come up. Very slow today. Um, so Logan Square is the neighborhood I live in in Chicago. And you put in uh, dates, 
say the 25th, two guests, search, and with, yeah, yeah, yeah. And with um, PageNation, you get all these, you know, it'll, you can paginate through the results. It's the data that's powering this. There's a lot of data about the listings. You've got a listing price. Um, and that's the sort of data we're getting. Now, there's some complications to this for what we're trying to do because... All right. <clears throat> you search for however many guests you have. Now, as an Airbnb host, I can tell you what happens is I've said on my like, apartments, you can't rent for less than two days. I don't want just overnight guests because by the time I clean it, it's a pain. I'm not, so I won't let people rent for less than two days. Some people will. Some people set the minimum at three days or four days. So we want to see all of the, we want to see everything that's available, but we want to make sure that we get everything. And, you, um, and we also want to do this. So like we start, our first scrape will be like, if today's what, the, the 12th? Our first scrape is like, okay, for checking in on the 13th, staying one night with three guests, show me everything in Logan Square. Okay, now on the 14th, now on the 15th, now on the 16th, we go out for the next 90 days. Then we start the whole thing over, say, staying for two nights. Now some new things are gonna pop up because my, my unit didn't come up. Now for three nights, and we go through like that, and it's kind of this very exhaustive search we do. Um, but all it's telling us is what's available. So then what we're gonna have to do, and we're gonna get into this in a little while, is we need to infer what was booked. All we're getting to see is what was, what's available. So we have to say, okay, yesterday, this unit over here was available, but today it's gone. So we, we can guess that was a booking. There's a, you could do more advanced data science -y stuff on that too. Um, this is, I guess, building up my whole thesis of actually getting in and doing this stuff things get tricky and you start having to like work around, you know, nobody's just giving you the data sets that you want to see. It's how do you, how do you collect third party data in a useful way? So uh, what I got. Um, talked about that, talked about that. So, and then there's also like um, multiple page nation. The point being, I saw every day, we're catching about 400 megabytes worth of JSONs, um, 540 calls. This all currently sits up on a cloud infrastructure. It's like a deployed little Python app. It does all of everything in the cloud, which is fun, but you can run it all locally. Um, and then what we're gonna do is take that data in and talk about how do we take these raw JSON requests and turn this into something that we can use and we can data science on if that makes sense. So, and I'm trying to, I'm sorry if I'm going fast, because I really, I want to set the background on this, and we can look at the code a little more, but I'm guessing you guys want to get into some data science-y type things. I mean, I don't know, we're kind of all over the place. I don't do workshops a lot, you couldn't tell. Um, yeah, the other thesis on this. Everybody talks about data scientists versus data engineers, and I never really was a big believer in this distinction. Um, you're both, the, what makes you worthwhile as a data scientist is you know how to go out and get some crazy data and do everything you need to do. The data scientists who have to have like a data engineer hand them a CSV file before they can start doing anything, um, you're a statistician. You might be a statistician at scale, but that's programming and statistics doesn't inherently make you data scientist, in my opinion might not be a popular. Um, but there was a lot of Python people in here, so I might have just shot myself in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what, even then, that's cool. You do a lot of SK Learn, at least you can go out and like grab your own data, whatever, man, you're, you're killing it. Um, so, that is that. Um, I'm going to, I don't know, take over from me for a second while I hot swap my computers. Sure. Um, so, Trevor may have said some of this already, but I'll just, uh, I guess, uh, reiterate it if you already said it, or if not, I'll fill in the holes. Um, he's got this uh, Python Bluemix app that is doing this daily scrape 
Uh, every day, it's running an Airbnb search to see what listings are available, and it's searching out for from today over the next 120 days. So it's basically looking like if I were looking to stay somewhere tomorrow, if I were looking to stay somewhere 120 days from now, and everywhere in between. Uh, it's getting those all as just uh, JSON objects and dumping them into the MongoDB. So that's why I was asking, like, who knows about MongoDB? Uh, that's the storage that we're using. And the motivation for that is basically just um, because it, it allows us to dump the JSONs in without transforming them at all. Um, we're doing, like, zero transformation, dumping it right into MongoDB. Uh, the next piece of the infrastructure, which I th are you pulling up Zeppelin now? Uh, I'm just kind of all over the place, okay. it's whatever. Who's used Zeppelin before? Not so oh, many. Oh, very few people. Okay. So, I had also barely used Zeppelin before uh, I started working on this, but uh, Trevor was, I don't know, he like evangelized it to me a little bit, and it's pretty sweet. Uh, so, Zeppelin is, it's sort of like... I described it once as the Spark equivalent of Jupyter Notebook. So if you're Python people, do you use Jupyter, the interactive notebook? Um, so Zeppelin is like that, but for Spark. Uh, but it's also way more than that because you can just declare whatever interpreter you want to use in any particular paragraph. So if you're like, well, this like little Damn. snippet of my pipeline is simple and doesn't need Spark, you can just have that paragraph be in Python, just simple Python. And then if your next paragraph needs to kick off a Spark job, then you just say, like, this paragraph is going to run Spark. And, like, we've got a couple of paragraphs that are doing, like, shell commands. Um, so you basically just get to choose, for each, for each paragraph, you get to choose your interpreter. Um, and if you want to do, like, a large data science job, you can have it kick off a job. On, you'll basically connect it to a Spark cluster, which... Uh, Trevor has a Spark cluster in Bluemix, and so his like Zeppelin is talking to a Spark cluster saying, run this job, and the results come back in this interactive notebook. Um, and so that is, that's going to be kind of the core of the workshop. Uh, so for those of you that are following along on your laptops, we'll have you actually like navigate to this link and copy our uh, Zeppelin notebooks, and you should be able to just kind of like possibly kick off jobs on Bluemix, assuming the uh, infrastructure holds up. Come on. Yeah, um, configuration. All right. Apply. Wait. I'm going to pause for questions now. Because we've been talking a lot and haven't done anything quite yet. Uh, and it's possible that people are totally lost and confused about what's going to happen, including ourselves. Uh, but does anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead. This multi-language feature that you're talking about, like like one paragraph in uh, the notebook could be one Python language and another paragraph could be Spark. Mm -hmm. So how does the variable exchange happen over there? So it's like... <laughs> there's, a, the, there's a... Zeppelin itself is written in Java. It's got a pool of memory. You can serialize something to that pool of memory in one language and then fish it out in the other language. So serialization, deserialization, we need to be done by ourselves and then... <laughs> Sort of, yeah. So like a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just print something to a string that looks like a TSV, like my data set, and then send it in like that and then pull it out as a string. But most things have something for dealing with TSVs and that's, that's how I serialize things back and forth. Um, yeah. So we are going to get into that as well. I want to just point out a couple things. If you're trying to like actually reproduce this at home, um, and then we'll time dependently maybe div dig a little deeper into it. There will be a GitHub repository, and this code base will be in it. And this is the, all this Python is everything that takes care of scraping Airbnb. Um, and you can look through it. It's some sort of clever Python calls here, there, and everywhere. And that's where that's at, um, th that we can, we can tear into. Uh, so if I forget before we get on to the next thing. So, no, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> tell me when you can see. Good? 
Cool. How about in the back? Can everybody read it? So those following along at home, okay. please go to https colon slash slash oh, and then, I don't know, Berlin dash buzz dash zeppelin dot mybluemix.net and we'll see what happens. I'm sorry. Hold on, let me get in my display and see if I can change that. Work better? You still see the regular text? Everybody got it? Everybody caught up? Who's following at home? Cool. Okay. If you click here and then click here. What's that? Slower? No. We're ready for me to start. Uh, yeah, Berlin dash buzz. Yep. Sorry? Uh, dot Zeppelin. Oh, it's a dash? It's a dash. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Raise your hand if you're having trouble. Good. Everyone's perfect. All right. Um, you should be at a page that looks like this. Open up this folder and please click on the load data notebook. So this is the this notebook goes through everything that downloads our data from Mongo, brings it in locally, and creates um, from our C it you, creates it moves it into CSVs and then creates um, Spark SQL tables. <clears throat> if you want to play with this on your own, for example. And, and you, can, you can keep it running on this server. Like I said, all these notebooks will also be available. You can download Zeppelin, you can upload these notebooks, and you'll have all this code. But if you want to play with it right now, because the notes should be locked, please do not type into these notes. Type clone this note. And for keeping sanity in some of this, slash whatever your name is, and then call it like, you know, you, it really at that point call it whatever you want. Um, and then underscore social security number. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just we needed a unique identifier. For, I'm just joking. <laughs> and then, yeah, clone it up. So I am going to talk through this. Um, and so here's kind of the tack. I'm thinking about taking because there is so much stuff going on in here. I'm going to, we're going to take turns talking through some of these notes um, in future ones. This is going to be how we're loading data in. There are some on exploring the data. There's some that gets into the machine learning. We don't do much machine learning, usually just a trivial example. Um, and in R, it doesn't work because there was something broken on the R setup on this thing that like I, I could get the data into R, I've got a data frame, I tried to run a linear model, and it just doesn't do anything. I'm, so if you're an R programmer, I'm sorry, there'll be nothing here for you. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna keep kind of talking through the notes, we're gonna take turns talking through the notes, and so if you're not following along, you just wanna hear about what everything's going on, that's fine. If you wanna get into it and start playing with stuff, uh, you're free, feel, free, eh, feel free to do that because it's a workshop and just raise your hands. Um, we have a couple people, whoever's not talking will be walking around and uh, Holden is also going to be helping out 
she was tricked very <laughs> cleverly. Um, <laughs> so, and yeah, hopefully this, uh, hopefully this notebook thing hold, or this server holds out. I've never, Zeppelin, while it does have a lot of cool things to it as a notebooking utility, it's especially great for big data. It is not great for multi-tenancy. This is very specifically a use case for which Zeppelin was not designed. But the alternative was trying to get everyone to download Docker containers and a lot of other weird stuff. So we made an executive decision and here we are. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, I don't know, you, you wanna go first or? You know the stuff. I can, do you, um, do you wanna show the downloading data as well? I could start with that. This is, that's what this is, isn't it? So I think there's one that even precedes this where we like. Oh, go nuts. Okay. So we just did, did the old bait and switch. We showed you one notebook, but actually if you can go, if I can even go, there's this other one called downloading data. Let's see if I can get it to load. struggling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, did it, did it break? All right. I can kickstart the thing if we end up having to do that. Um, and if I do, then we'll just say everyone stay off it. I think, I think we broke it. That's what I was afraid of. <sighs> this is why we can't have nice things. Oh, there you go. Oh. Is that it? I think so. That was the same one that I was just on. Uh, darn it. Yeah, it's low daily scrape data, man. This is the one that downloads it. Oh, that pulls that out of Mongo? No, that is not what this is. All right, I'm going to kickstart the whole thing. Okay. Um, sorry about that. While he's doing that, just out of curiosity, who came to this because uh, they have an Airbnb that they're renting out and they wanted to uh, make sure they were optimizing their revenues? Yep. I see two hands. <laughs> right, you want to you do the cash flow analysis? That's fair. So maybe I'll do another quick poll. Um, who here considers, or who, who here in their job or as a hobby does data science -y stuff? Okay, quite a few people. And does, and maybe I should distinguish between like, uh, do you consider yourself more like on the sort of data engineering, like getting the data and, uh, you know, doing the ingest and uh, transform, or are you actually working more on the, uh, like the analysis or, or everything? Like, so of those people that raise their hand for I do data science, uh, are you, raise your hand again if you're like, I do the end analysis. Uh, oh, wow, okay, just so fewer people. So more people are on like kind of infrastructure and engineering. Is that, raise your hand if that's more you. Or both, right, or both. So you can raise your hand for both, for sure. Sorry? Uh, I missed that one more time. <laughs> yeah. You only raise half your hand for both. <laughs> All right. So I guess I'm just going to talk about this now. Sorry that it's not going to be as hands-on as we thought it was. I do apologize. Um, but... 
All right. So maybe. Man, this thing's still struggling. Uh, there you go. All right. Go ahead and talk. Cool. Um, yeah, so I put these uh, helpful re reminders here about uh, the data schema and uh, example data, so maybe it'd be helpful to actually look at those. Um, so can you pull that first link? Mm -hmm. So we, I, we sort of like waved our hands and said like, we're pulling these like list, this listing information from Airbnb, um, but I'm guessing that a lot of you were having trouble visualizing what that data looked like. So here, uh, this kind of shows you the schema. Um, and since it's JSON, it's like, it's like nested schema. So at the, uh, at the very top level, every, every MongoDB record has an ID, um, just like a unique ID to identify the record. Um, but then sort of the meat of it is <laughs> that page that we, were, we basically just scrolled past is the listing information, which basically includes like, what's the name of the host, what's the description, uh, it's got links to the photos of the listing. Um, and then this is like the other meat of it, which is an actual pricing quote where it says like for this listing, for a given date and a given number of guests, what, what's the price? Um, and then the next thing to look at, because maybe you're still probably having trouble visualizing this, is uh, actually looking at an, exa an example data point. So, can you try clicking on that other tab? Uh, no. <laughs> again. Um, are people still hanging out on that website? I assure you this is not a, uh, this is not an indictment of the reliability of Bluemix. Um, <laughs> I feel like it's, maybe some of you are silently suspecting that the infrastructure is at fault. Really it was just us uh, not having a really good plan of how to uh, you know, how to use the, the right tool for the right job here. So blame us, don't blame, uh, don't blame our corporate sponsor. All right. There you go. Okay, cool. And then, yeah, can you get, open the example data in another, in another tab? And then... Okay, so this is now just one example data point. Um, just to, again, give you like, help you visualize what we're actually dealing with here. Um, so these, those links that you just saw are links to all the photos for a listing. Um, this right here tells you like how many guests and whether they're adults, infants, or children. Uh, and then sort of the key, uh, the key data that we're going to be going off of is uh, the check-in date and the nightly price. Are we yes, Sorry. but if, if you do it right now, that's what makes the thing crash because it's simultaneously one machine trying to like serve the web front end and do this stuff. So I think we're going to do like a everyone all together sort of thing. Um, yes. Because it does seem to be running better now. Um, case in point, we're going to start talking about the analysis. Cool. Go ahead. You did it. So um, first uh, thing you do when you start data sciencing is, you know, don't uh, just start throwing <laughs> algorithms at things. Let's like take a look at our data and get a feel for what's going on and maybe where some of the hiccups and gotchas might be. A really cool thing about Zeppelin is when you start running things in SQL, which we had CSV files, we loaded them into SQL, uh, you get 
for free these nice little charts. We can do some interactive charting. We can start exploring our data. Um, this actually, I'm going to put it back on good because nobody, I don't think anybody particularly cares precisely what I sequeled. We just want to look at pretty charts <laughs> and make that jump. Displays. Apply. So, first thing we want to look at, by neighborhood, by beds, what's our, ni what's our nightly average booking price? Um, there's a 10 bed in Logan Square that goes for 1400 a night. And that's cool, but there's probably not a lot of them. Um, you can look, so this is pretty much what we, I mean, if anything, we start doing this to smell test, like, are we seeing weird stuff that is, just looks totally off? And this doesn't. A one bed is about 116 a night, up to 200. As we have more beds per night, we get more, it's more and more expensive. It's reasonable. Interesting that there's probably a couple of units. It's probably not a lot of units that they jump up to five and six beds that are cheaper. Um, it's slow to counter counterintuitive, but at the same time, it probably means there's just one of them, and they aren't that nice. Um, Avondale is a neighborhood up the train line a little bit. Still a pretty nice place, but not quite as hopping as Logan Square. So <laughs> that's that. Quick pause. Did you have a question? It's hard to read it. The oh, so, well, let's see. I'll go. I'm gonna zoom in. The problem is, it like it wants to reform. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. And right, just yeah, yeah in case I, that is nicer. Yeah, okay. There we go. Is that a happy medium? Cool. Right. Yeah, and just to kind of quickly orient you to, to what you're looking at here in case it wasn't um, obvious at first glance. So we're just looking at two neighborhoods, Logan Square and Avondale. Vertical axis is just price, and, uh, and then each of these colors within each neighborhood is a different number of bedrooms. So, <laughs> and uh, somewhat annoyingly, uh, the numbers of bedrooms are not perfectly sorted uh, in these charts. It was just some weird like quirk of what Zeppelin's doing, um, I think. So you, it's you. Anyways, if, if you hover over, then you can see the number of bedrooms. Uh, next chart is so this is again by neighborhood, but this is by day of the week that the person's checking in. Um, so this is basically, you know, you you might think that weekends are more valuable than weekdays. Or maybe like depending on the neighborhood, you might think the opposite. Um, and so we were just kind of like, well, let's see. Like what, what is uh, the value of like a f staying on a Friday versus staying on a Wednesday? Um, can you hover over some of those actually for a second? So like in Logan Square, this uh, like the top one here is Saturday at 168 a night. Thursday is lower at about 120 a night. Um, and like, again, like the value of this that sort of like Trevor was saying, partially it's because we're interested in knowing that stuff, but also partially it's because we want to see just like, does this, does it, did we even like analyze, did we even get the data that we thought we got? Um, like, is our data dirty? Do we have like weird outliers in there? Uh, which we did. Like we had all these like weird artifacts in our data that we had to clean up before we got charts that like made sense and the way that we found that was we really basically saw like oh that's weird like this uh bar is like going off the chart and like why is that and it's because you know we were like pulling from this undocumented api and it the, like the scrape went down for a month and you know just it was like real world data problems that were causing artifacts in the data like here's one that i haven't removed yet like this is I was looking at it last night. I know it's an artifact, and I was just like, I'm not going to have a chance to remove that before the talk. Um, and the artifact is you can pull your uh, listing down up to 24 hours, or you can let someone book as late as today. So if I'm scraping and looking for check-ins tomorrow, but certain people have their check-in like 24 hour, they have, have a minimum of 24 hour lead time on their check-in, well, it looks like they had it booked, but it different, it didn't, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah, so again, it's kind of like the, uh, the caution of don't just start throwing machine learning algorithms at your data before you've done some simple uh, visualizations to see if, like, see if your data actually is what you think it is. 
Uh, let's see what we got here. <clears throat> yes, or it looks like half the stuff was. It looks like everyone who has a 24 hour minimum and also the time changes. So for some people it might be, I want 24 hours before four o'clock. Or some people it's 24 hours between six o'clock. Or some people are like, you can book until midnight day of. But if the thing scraped at three in the afternoon and it, it started scraping at three and it was done at five and the, the cutoff was four, so it's not even consistent necessarily like day over day, you just have to say, you know what, I got a lot of mess in here, so I'm just gonna hack off that first day. I'm gonna miss some bookings. Some people do book that last day. We could probably, if we wanna do some more data science and we needed to know that, we could do some really cool, that's like a really good machine learning thing. If we're starting to see like, you know, depending what time the scrape happened, you could, you could do some inference there and you could dig into it and you could probably find out unit by unit what their cutoff was and then reverse apply some rules. But we were doing first passes and we're like, nope, cheap, throw it out. Um, but yeah. Like you'll see in some of the, if you go back and look at this stuff later, you'll see in some of our SQL queries, we like have this very kind of reasonable looking SQL query and then we also just have like where check-in date does not equal like February 26th because like the scraper went down on a certain day and we just know that like all the data from that day and all our inferred bookings from that day are garbage. So there's like these very arbitrary looking like just throw that data completely away because it's garbage. So once you get done doing all of your looking through your data and cleaning and finding all these like nasty little things, this is another thing that I uh, am a really big fan of about Zeppelin, and it's a really cool thing about Spark too, that you can use your SQL. I think SQL is a better language than Pandas for creating rectangles of data. It was a language that was written specifically for that, as opposed to just downloading a big lump of data and then trying to use Pandas and it's SQL-like joins. Just, just build it in SQL, man. Get your data set up, do your thing. But dealer's choice. So in this case, all right, let's build a table of features. Um, do it in SQL, we can visualize it, we can interact. We use the SQL context, we basically build it, we're using our query interactively, making sure it looks like we want it to look. Then copy and paste that into Python. Can you guys see this? Do I need to make it bigger again so we can see code? I'll just do it anyway. Um, literally copy and paste my SQL thing, and then that pulls the data frame into pandas. So we said we had a lot of Python programmers. So guessing everyone's SK Learn. Okay, or whatever. Nobody's fighting me. I'm just broken your spirits. All right, that's good too. Um, and then from there, it's just into doing normal SK Learn stuff. And if you've been data sciencing for a while, like your mind's probably already reeling on this data set. There's like so many different directions we can go with it. Uh, so everything from, you know, simple, let's do, what was this? I think we, oh, did a DB scan. Um, problem on this one, this is a pretty good size machine, even though we did manage to crash it, uh, or at least we crashed the web front end of it. DB scan on this, um, I forgot, do you remember how many rec records we got? If I remember right, it was like 100,000 something. Yeah, maybe that was, I don't know. So it didn't come back huge, but at any rate, DB scan ran for like 30 minutes for me and I couldn't get anything out of it. Um, you could let it run for, oh, you know what? I didn't turn up the parallelism, so that was my bad. Okay, so the point is, if you let this thing run long enough, you will eventually hit a size where you have scaled yourself out of R and Python. At which point, we move on down the line to Spark ML. <laughs> and that's another cool thing about working in this environment. We just swap over to our Spark ML. Same general idea. Now we're doing a lot of the same kind of things, with, but building our pipelines in a slightly different way. And in this case, uh, I guess you did this analysis. You want to talk about it? Yeah. Um, so maybe just a few things worth mentioning about this. Uh, Oh, okay, so I, heard, I see that, uh, you know, Trevor mentioned Spark ML, and like, I feel like people kind of perked up, and they're like peering at the code, um, which means I think our instincts were right, that like, oh, we should probably try to include something about Spark ML in this talk, because it seems to be pretty hip right now. 
Uh, only problem was I'd never used Spark ML before. So, hey, Holden, can you help me like write some Spark ML here? Just some like starter code. So thank you to Holden. Um, and so basically what this is, like, <laughs> um, you can, uh, this is just a, a, a pretty basic um, pipeline, sort of hello world, like Trevor was saying, um, to apply a random forest regressor to, um, to our data. And we were looking at booking price based on um, star rating. So basically trying to predict... Um, trying to predict booking price based on star rating as like a single feature, um, which is <laughs> um, leaving, we left some snarky comments to ourselves in there as well. Um, but so the point is like, if, if you've never used Spark ML before um, and you're like, oh, it's like something I would like to try, like just copy this, grab it. Um, I put a link to the documentation in there. And so you can kind of be like, okay, I have a working example that I can build off of and make it actually good. Um, and, oh, and the other, like, the other thing that's worth pointing out about that is, um, this is just kind of like a nice feature of Zeppelin, that that's a totally separate notebook than uh, we had loaded our data in, and it's a totally separate notebook than we had defined our tables in, but we're still able to just grab, even though it's, not only is it a different paragraph, it's a totally different notebook, we're able to, like, make Spark ML code that references Spark SQL tables that we cr created in a different paragraph. So, well done, Zeppelin. And last little bit then is, um, we didn't really do introductions, but um, I'm a PMC on the Mahout project, and so I always manage to shoehorn this into any time I talk about anything. Um, so, I recently wrote a framework for multi-layer perceptrons and doing some neural networks. And while everyone loves to throw neural networks at anything, you really should try to stick with like, like no, like unstructured data, like really unstructured data, like text analysis and voice analysis and pictures. Um, there's usually a better statistical approach. So then the question was, well, what do we have in here that we can work with? Airbnb has lots of pictures of the units. Um, this is actually the thing I'm most proud of with this entire thing, and I highly recommend everyone check it out. Holden was already sharpshooting me a little bit on it, but um, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Mike, you can't defend yourself. It's great. <laughs> At any rate, though, it's fun. It's, a, it's an RDD. It takes a, it's a RDD of URLs and then does a mapping function and downloads and vectorizes each, each targeted link. So then we have an RDD of vectors that represent images. Does that make sense? Everyone tracking me on that? You can take an image and you can stretch it out into a vector of pixel values. But why? But give, give the con like, why are you doing that? Because it can be done. <laughs> um, but there's a legitimate reason too in this, like in this context. Like we're doing image analysis on the listings. Oh yeah, so that's what the next part is. So then run some multi-layer perceptrons on it, let it rock and roll. Um, I've been having trouble with it all day. Well, it keeps heap space errors. MLPs are kind of fat, and this is technically a work in progress that I'm still open PR. So I've done some bug <laughs> testing. I learned it doesn't scale well. Pretty excited about that. Um, so that's then the kind of the end of it. Um, I was really hoping everybody would be able to do stuff a little bit more, and the timing was going to be a bit different. So. I want to open this up to questions and thoughts because we now have really covered a ton of ground and I want to dive in where you guys are interested. You brave few that remained. <laughs> um, yeah. Go ahead. I was wondering what are you trying to do here with, with images? You had... I was just wondering what are you trying to do with images? Uh, prove that I can do something with them is about all I got. I think the um, the training on this, there is, there's room types, it's a classification. Can we use an image to tell if it's like an apartment, a single room, um, a house, blah, blah, blah. A more, another interesting thing to do is if we had another pricing model, we could look at the error. What I would actually try doing is looking at the error of my pricing model and seeing if the image could explain away any of the variance. Residual analysis kind of thing. Have you looked in TensorFlow? TensorFlow is not a product that I care too much for. Um, Why? For a number of reasons. Uh, 
because I tried using it once and I hated the API because Google ruins Python. They take a very expressive and fun to work with language and they make it very unexpressive and like bad Java. Um, and so that was about a year ago and I spent a week on it and I'm like, this is stupid and I never came back. Um, other than that, it's an open source project, sort of, like come on down and put all your stuff on Google. I got it, I don't know, I got a lot of stuff. I'm, oh man, it's recording too. I should, well, I guess I'm on the record now. I don't like TensorFlow, so there it is. Um, there's a number of other problems with it too. Go get on, go listen to Amazon, they'll tell you. <laughs> Everything they say. That's what I. That's why I don't like it. Um, yeah. So, for those of you that have been trying to follow along on your laptops, have you been able? Have you tried like running any of these uh, Zeppelin paragraphs? Has anybody raise your hand if you've been able to successfully run a Zeppelin paragraph while you're sitting there? That's good because okay. I very explicitly yeah. said don't we, do that. We asked you not to, so that, like um, good, good for good for following instructions, and also good for not admitting that you you know disobeyed us. But I was also just curious to see if uh, if there was any any actual interaction going on. I guess go nuts now. Maybe if there's only half as many people, it won't wreck it. And I don't. I'm not talking through anything. Um, yeah. Other questions? Things that seemed interesting. Thoughts about doing this at home? Has this changed how you priced your Airbnbs? I didn't actually get around to building it to like this week. Um, most of the stuff. I turned the scraper on in January and I was going to look at, I, you'll notice I had Logan Square and Avondale. I was interested in getting another place in Avondale. I ended up just seeing one that was like a good price so I just went for it and hoped for the best. Um, which is another really fun comment on just data science in general is Sometimes you just gut, gut decisions when you have low, small amounts of data. Um, I would trust a good palm reader over a mediocre data scientist all day, every day. All right, well, I don't know, I'm not gonna like make you sit here just so I can hear myself talk. If you do have questions, we've got the room for another 40 minutes. Um, like I said, as people clear out, if you want to try getting on there, and hopefully if it's not under too much load. I think the machine is huge. I think the load problem comes from, um, it, was, it wasn't meant to be a web server, and I think that's what was crashing it out. So you can try getting on there and doing stuff, and it'll be up. I can kickstart it if it breaks, but yeah, hang out, talk, whatevs. Thanks for coming out. Thanks, guys.